Good day, and welcome to this service at First Baptist Church of Loveland, Colorado. We hope you garner something from our service today, and you furthers your growth as a Christian. Just a few announcements. Um, the churches we have been working with in Nicaragua over the last 20 years, um, we're looking at some small business ideas. So if you have a small business idea, um, please um, send it to the, myself or the church office and we can use that to um, put together some programs for them in the main churches we, we've been working with in Nicaragua. Um, next Sunday, we welcome um, Reverend Duncan Miller um, as our guest speaker. And just a reminder, it is Mother's Day. So if you've not remembered your mother, it's, you've got about seven days to think of that. Um, please take time. Um, our givings are down during this period of time. Um, we, some, we anticipated that, but please take time to either mail a check to the church office or donate with our um, online contribution button on our website. Um, this morning, we welcome Reverend Jan Park to give us our message and a communion service. Um, if you have a chance, um, you're more than welcome to gather the elements at home and uh, partake with her as she shares that with us this morning. Her message title this morning is, Who is My Neighbor? Shall we start with a minute of silence? <laughs> Shall we join in our invocation prayer? Shall we pray? Dear Lord, as we gather, most of us in our homes, help us to be mindful that where two or three are gathered, there are you in the midst of us. Help us to learn and to grow from this service and help us to be mindful of who our neighbor is and help us to reach out and be kind to, to each other and help us to have patience and help us to grow in service to you, and help us to open our hearts to the message this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our invocation reading this morning How shall we live? We will love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our being, and with all our mind. How shall we love? We will love our neighbor as ourselves. Who is our neighbor? Our neighbor lies by the road in pain. Our neighbor goes to bed hungry. Our neighbor has lost hope. How shall we love our neighbor? We will respond with love and compassion. We will do what is needed to help others. We will care for one another. Our invocation hymn, is a long favorite, and just since we've just passed Earth Day, it's probably a, a fitting hymn for the beauty of the earth.
Our special music this morning is a piece entitled Breathe. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is the This is me. Our second reading this morning is taken from Psalm 82. God has taken his place in divine counsel. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. 
They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I say, you are gods, children of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. Shall we join in our song of praise, Create in me a clean heart. Good morning. The gospel lesson for today is from the uh, 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, starting with the 25th verse. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, well, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him for dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw, them, saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw this man, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took, and, um, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to the lawyer, go and do likewise. One hot North Carolina afternoon in the 1950s, two men were traveling together to do some work for another family member. On the way home, after a long day of work, they came upon a couple of teenage boys selling watermelons. They stopped and discussed the virtue and price of the melons for a few moments, 
Believing the younger men to be from a nearby farm, they asked about the quality of the bird hunting on the, at the farm and the possibilities of an invitation to do so. One of the boys said, Mister, these watermelons are the only thing we have in this world. The two men bought all of them without further negotiation or discussion. Our neighbor is the person we stop to help, and our neighbor is the person from whom we are willing to accept help. Luke 10, 27 reminds us, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. The commandments of God and the story of the neighbor who showed mercy aren't merely, merely about being nice or even doing the right thing. They are about the nearness of God, the nearness of grace in our hands and our mouths every single day. Sometimes you end up with a bill at a Jericho Road Inn. Sometimes you end up with a bunch of watermelons. Someone, sometimes someone pays your bill or buys your watermelons, but the word is very close to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, waiting for you to do it, as it says in Deuteronomy 30, 14. And it is a blessing. Our identity as a person and as a Christian, is the starting point from which all other details of our lives will either be aligned or skewed. Who are we? What is the thing we know so intimately about ourselves on a visceral level that prompts us to worship the living God? Through God's gift of grace, we are inescapably God's own sons and daughters. And with that identity comes responsibility. This command to love our neighbors places a special obligation on us to love our neighbors. And it seems like a most particularly useful um, thing to remember and to, and to live out in this day of pandemic when there are so many people suffering and having a hard time. Of course, we may love people who are not our neighbors, but we cannot love them at the expense of loving our neighbors people who live near us or with whom we have some sort of a connection. However, that's not really the point of Jesus in the parable of the Good Samaritan. His emphasis is that we must not exclude people from those we consider neighbors. The priest and the Levite passed by the injured man. Since Jesus is answering the question, who is my neighbor, the presumption is that they didn't help him because they didn't see him as a neighbor. Why might that be? Well, we don't really know, but we can ima imagine at least three reasons. One reason why a person might not see someone as a neighbor is that you don't know him or her. Do you have to know someone in order to consider him or her a neighbor? The priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan didn't know the injured man. And yet Jesus clearly expected them to stop and help him. So you can't say, I don't know him, therefore I have no responsibility toward him. That's the main point. But we may, we may wonder, what placed a responsibility on the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan? What put them in the role of neighbor to the injured man? Simply the fact that they were in the same place at the same time. Now, a second reason why a person might not see someone as a neighbor is that he or she may be of a different race, religion, or status. Jesus makes it clear that this isn't al allowed by including the Samaritan in the story. He was of a different race and religion and possibly status to the injured man. If someone on your street is Indian or Chinese, or an illegal immigrant, or the Lord Provost of Edinburgh, he or she is still your neighbor. A third reason why a person might not see someone as a neighbor is that he or she needs a particular kind of love, a kind of love that we are not very willing to offer. Suppose we imagine Jesus' parable unfolding a different way. The man in Jesus' story is not attacked by robbers. He's a Jew 
and he comes to the priest and Levi for counseling and spiritual advice. They don't know him, but they're delighted. Spiritual advice is right up their alley. They warm to him, and in this context, they see him as a neighbor. If that alternative version in any way reflects reality, then a, pos a possible reason why the priest and Levi didn't help the injured man is because of the kind of help that he needed. Binding of wounds. And that was outside their comfort zone. Years ago, I worked for an engineering company in uh, the Bay Area in California, and, and uh, we had a lot of, in well, the place was full of engineers. And one day, um, Someone was injured, and the receptionist downstairs paged over the loudspeaker for someone who would come and help take care of this injured person. And one of the guys I worked with almost fainted because he couldn't stand the sight of blood. So I thought that was kind of interesting. The kind of love that Samaritan needed was not a kind of love that perhaps these people wanted to offer. Therefore, they didn't see him as a neighbor. I speculated why the priest and Levi didn't consider the injured man a neighbor. I don't know the real reason. But we can't know now. It's been too long ago. But I imagined two possible reasons. They might have said to themselves, we don't know him, or we don't do blood and messy things. I also imagined one reason the Samaritan might not have considered the, uh, the man a neighbor. He might have said to himself, he's not my, of my race or religion, but that didn't stop him from helping. Jesus' parable is very applicable today. It concerns a priest and a Levite, so it's aimed squarely at religious people, people that we like to think that we are. We are in danger of acting like the priest and the Levite. The question Jesus was asked was, who is my neighbor? We need to avoid making the concept of neighbor too big. People who live near us or who come in contact with us are neighbors. But everyone in the world is not our neighbor. God is omnipresent, present everywhere. And he can love everyone. We don't quite have that capability. However, the main focus of Jesus' parable is to avoid making the concept of neighbor too small. We cannot restrict our concept of neighbor neighbor because we don't know a person, or he or she is different, or because he or she needs, has needs that make us feel uncomfortable. Think what would happen if all the doctors and nurses and other hospital personnel right now felt that way about the people who come in with this horrible virus that we're fighting. One need look no further than the parable of the Good Samaritan for evidence that our self-congratulatory nature is not a recent development in human nature. The parable begins with the questions of a legal scholar who wanted to prove that he was right, or in other translations, wanted to justify himself. The priest and the Levite do something similar when they encounter the bruised and beaten man on the side of the road. How they must have congratulated themselves for staying unsullied, keeping themselves pure and holy. And for all that, they missed the opportunity to participate in the work of mercy that God had laid out before them. What struck me about this familiar story is not that the Samaritan helped the Jew, but rather the extent to which the Samaritan helped him. Our Samaritan exemplar was not only willing to pull over, see what had really happened, and then engage. He went well beyond that. He took his charge to a nearby inn and gave the innkeeper what amounted to a blank check to do whatever made sense. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Mr. Samaritan could have ended his involvement there and then, but he committed to returning and full, after fulfilling another commitment. The Samaritan was a man who knew the blessing of grounding one's life in faithful, loving kindness to others. The lawyer whose original question prompted Jesus to tell this story could not have missed this. The issue for our lawyer was not to understand the limit of his responsibility, but rather the extent 
of his opportunity. And so it is for us. Where do our gifts, vocation and avocation, create opportunities to bless the lives of others with the steadfast loving kindness of the gospel of the kingdom of God? Where does my church's time, talent, and treasure offer corporate opportunities for the same? Where these answers lead is where we can validate God's steadfast love to us by extending it to others. When I lived near San Francisco for about 20 years, we would ride, go up to the city and we would ride the cable cars. The area where the cable cars began their run was a congregating place for people who had a message that they wanted others to hear. Once there was a woman shouting. She held a Bible high in the air with one hand, and with the other hand she had balled into a fist and was punching the air with every phrase that she said. She pleaded for people to find salvation in Jesus before judgment came and it was too late. I vacillated emotionally between feeling bad for her to being angry with her. I felt bad because she was so obviously being ignored. I was angry because she was talking about Jesus. She wasn't speaking like Jesus. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's the question of the lawyer who comes to test Jesus. Without punching the air or even a brief shout, Jesus asks the lawyer what he thinks. The lawyer quotes two short verses about God loving about loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus says he got the answer right. Love is the answer. Oh, sure, to a rich young ruler who asked the same questions, Jesus quoted some of the Ten Commandments. To another, he said to approach God as a child. He tells a nocturnal Pharisee to be born again or born from above. To his disciples, he says to feed the hungry and give drink to the thirsty. He never answers the question the same way, and he never does it with a shout or a punch. But sometimes he does tell a story about mercy. Go and do likewise, he says. Help other people. When did you learn that lesson? That is one of the very basic lessons we normally learn at a very early age. It reminds me of that book, Everything I Needed to Learn, I Learned in Kindergarten. Sometimes someone drops something, you pick it up. Someone falls down on the playground, you help them up. If there is someone who is in need, you share what you have been given with them. Help other people. <clears throat> Did you notice how the expert in the law began with a faulty premise? He wanted to get eternal life. Where does he put the responsibility for inheriting heaven? What must I do to inherit eternal life? He sees it as his responsibility to gain to heaven, something that he must do. To those who try to depend on themselves to enter heaven, Jesus asks a very simple question. What is written in the law? How do you read it? Jesus points the expert in the law back to where he was supposed to be an expert. Jesus points him back to the Bible and what he had learned from studying it. He quickly responds by quoting the Old Testament. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbor at yourself. And Jesus responds, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. There was a half dead man, mugged, beaten and left to, left to die, who lay on the side of the road from Jerusalem. Maybe having gone there to worship, we don't know why he went there. The priest comes along and sees a dying man and hears his groans. Certainly this man of God will help, right? 
After all, this is someone who has been instructed in God's word, who heard the promise of God's ultimate help in the promise of a savior, who saw the sacrifices offered at the temple as reminders of the cost of sin that God himself would pay for him and for all people. But the priest, maybe concluding that the man was going to die anyway, or afraid he was going to be the next victim, quickly flees the crime scene. Now, this, this whole story is told very beautifully in the, in the musical Godspell. And if you haven't seen it, I'd urge you to check it out. Then along came a Levite, that group of Jewish people that God had chosen to help the priests in their work. The Levite follows in the priest's footsteps and quickly goes his way. Then comes a Samaritan. Now, the Jews hated the Samaritans because they were what you might call half-Jews. The Samaritans were the result of Jews marrying the original inhabitants of the Promised Land. And being a half-Jew was worse than not being a Jew at all in the eyes of the Jews. A good Jew would never talk to a Samaritan or acknowledge their presence. You might compare it to the relationship between the Israelis and Palestinians today. Vicious hatred of one another. But the Samaritan in Jesus' parable did the unthinkable. The Samaritan picked up the man who, if he was able, probably would have refused his help. And the Samaritan personally cares for this man. When the Samaritan leaves, he provides enough money for two months of care and promises for more money if it is necessary. Which one was the neighbor? Jesus asked. The answer is, was obvious, but did you notice how the expert in the law could not even bring himself to say the name Samaritan? He says, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus' parable clearly showed that there are not loopholes for his command to love God and to love others. It is not merely a knowledge of the law, which the priest and the Levite were certainly all experts in doing. What the law says without exception. Such a message leads us to realize that there is only one thing for us to hold up before God that can possibly make us worthy of inheriting eternal life. And that is the one who stood before the expert in the law. For this man who patiently taught this expert in the law was always patient, his words coming from a heart of perfect love. He longed for those who tried to trip him up by their carefully crafted questions. He mourned for the people who rejected him and his salvation. He prayed for those who pounded nails into his hands and feet. The love that Jesus had f has for us would not allow him to cross over to the other side of human history and leave us to suffer eternally for our sins. Instead, Jesus' love would lead him to the cross. Jesus loved his father with every fiber of his being throughout his whole life for thus who have not. He loved God and loved those around him perfectly in our place and in love was willing to sacrifice his life in order to give to us all that we need to inherit eternal life. Jesus makes sinners right with God as he, as he reaches down to us through faith and covers us completely with his perfect life and perfect love and declares us inheritors of heaven. The amazing and perfect love of our Savior is at the heart and core of what leads us to be good Samaritans. In Jesus, we find every reason to reflect to others the cares and concerns he has shown to us. While the main purpose of the Christian church is to provide for the spiritual care of others, Christians who have experienced the love of their Savior, Savior are naturally going to look f to help others with their physical needs. Some of the first hospitals and orphanage, orphanages were started by Christians. And do you know why people found them so strange? Because they not only helped their own, that is, fellow Christians, but they cared for those who were not Christians. Will people say the same of us? My prayer is that they will, and they will see you and me as people who are genuinely concerned about others, leading people through our care and love to see the perfect love of Jesus and the riches of heaven that Jesus has won for all.
<laughs> now I suspect some of you have children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren, and you probably know who Mr. Rogers is. In 1997, Fred Rogers of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood received a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Daytime Emmys. In front of handsome soap stars and women in the highest fashion available, he walked on stage and bowed slightly. And he invited the crowd to remember their loved ones. He asked them to think of the people who had loved them in such a way as to get them to this place, a seat at the daytime Emmys. Then he asked them if they would be willing to take 10 seconds to call those loved ones to mind. 10 whole seconds. 10 seconds to remember those who had been kind to them, those who gave them a break, those who helped them become who they were that day, those who had been their neighbors. He lifted his wrist, pointed to his watch, and told them that he would watch the clock. Uncomfortable laughter ensued until they realized he was serious. They were going to sit in those chairs for 10 seconds of silence. No set change, no musical interlude, just their breathing and their thinking. One second, two seconds, five, nine, ten whole seconds. Ten seconds was long enough for tears to gather in their eyes, for jaws to clench holding back emotion, all for memories of those who had been their neighbors. Each of us can name people who helped us to become who we are. There are, there are some who gave us a break, who offered us kindness, mercy, a helping hand. Would you, along with me, take 10 seconds to think of people who have helped you become who you are today? Seriously, 10 seconds. Let's do that right now. Perhaps remembering when we needed a neighbor will help us understand how to be a neighbor. Won't you be my neighbor? On the night before Jesus gave himself up for us, he invited all of his disciples to share in the Passover feast with him. And during that feast, he took the bread he gave thanks to God for the bread and for all things that, that, and because God gives us all things that we have. And he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, O Lord, for the fruit that you give to us, the bread, and all the things that it encounters. We thank you for these gift, this gift. And likewise, after he had given out the bread, he took the cup. And again, he gave thanks to God for the fruit of the vine, and he passed the cup to, this, to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my, the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord God, we thank you for these holy acts that you have given us to do so that we may remember who you are and what you have done for each and every one of us. Amen. Shall we bow our heads for our closing prayer? Holy One, draw us together in your love that we may know you more deeply 
open our hearts to a deeper understanding of your will and work within our lives that we may produce the fruit of compassion. Open our eyes to see the places in our world where our compassion can help. Give us loving hearts that we may reach out to our neighbors when they are in need. Grant us the courage to take risks for the sake of your kingdom. Help us to live lives that are worthy of you. Amen. Shall we join in our closing hymn, They Know We Are Christians. Thank you for joining us today. Please remember the story of the Good Samaritan and go out, help those who are your neighbors, because the world is full of neighbors, and some of them need help, and sometimes we need help. So go with the blessings of God, and may you enjoy the spring weather, and may we look all, all of us look forward to the end of the pandemic so that we can gather together again. Amen.